Uh, welcome to our first AfriPop Gen webinar of the year. And today we have an exciting pharmacogenomics talk um, by George Darosha and Dr. Hussein Osman. Uh, the talk is titled Annotating African Variants uh, in ADMI Genes. Um, so just a quick introduction. Um, so George Darosha is a PhD candidate at the Sydney Brenner Institute for Molecular Bioscience. Um, he is investigating genomic variants of potential pharmacogenomic impact via genomic and, prote and protein-based analysis. Uh, his MSc work also consisted of variant analysis relevant to cancer pharmacogenomics in Africa. Uh, George enjoys working in bioinformatics and takes active roles in teaching and sharing what he has learned. And he's also engaged in multiple community outreach programs, which help to teach school learners more about genomics. And uh, Dr. Hussein is a co-founder of Helixa Scientific, uh, a startup for providing bioinformatics and genomic services. Um, however, recently, uh, he is a postdoc fellow at the Sydney Brenner Institute for Molecular Bi Bioscience. And he's also working on the H3 Africa GSK Consortium uh, together with George uh, in analyzing the pharmacogenomic diversity in Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, without further ado, uh, over to you, George. Cool, thank you, David. Uh, great introductions. Uh, so yeah, I'm George. I'm from the Sydney Brenner Institute at Fitz University. And I'm gonna be speaking to you today about work we've done to add more information to African variation, specifically in ADME genes. So what are ADME genes? These are genes which are generally implicated in drug response reactions. And they're all related to some factor of behavior uh, that the drug goes through in your body either the absorption, the distribution, the metabolism of it, or the excretion of the molecules. And we, of course, are researching the changes in DNA, which likewise would affect the protein structures of those genes and thus have a physical impact on drug response. So how many ADME genes are there? Uh, there is a list kept by Farm ADME, which has defined 295 ADME genes. Of those, 32 are core genes, genes that we have a lot of evidence for, um, that we know that they're involved in drug reactions, and 263 extended genes, uh, which are, you know, it's not that we don't think that they're involved in drug reactions, just there isn't as strong evidence for that. And of course, the core genes include some of our favorites. Um, cytochrome is quite prevalent in the core genes. Cytochrome 2D6, very important for cancer drug metabolism. 3A5 and 3A4, very important for broad drug metabolism. And DPYD for some specific drugs like pleurouracil. Of course, we needed African data sets to investigate, and we are fortunate to work with excellent collaborators who helped us put together the high coverage African ADME data set. Um, collecting a, a large amount of genomic data from across the African continent, um, forming two strong bases in Southern Africa and Western Africa. Now, annotation and prediction. I'm keeping this fairly broad uh, for the broad audience here, uh, but it's quite an interesting topic across genetic fields too. So what these mean are to add existing info onto a genetic variant regarding its type, where it is, you know, its position, coordinates, other names for it, um, or maybe even a prediction. Is this variant likely to disrupt my gene function? Is it likely not to? Is it conserved? Is it not? And there are a lot of tools to do this. Conventional tools, which you may know of, are SIFT and polyphen that can help characterize your variants into tolerated or non-tolerated or deleterious or not. And then other tools can incorporate, you know, additional metrics like conservation, et cetera, to try and get you a more honed in view. Now, traditionally, you would use this tool in a fashion like you have a variant, you don't know much about it, you give it to your annotation or prediction tool, and it gives you an outcome in a binary sense, nasty or good or deleterious or neutral. Um, but since they've expanded, you know, to extend that range to you know, maybe there isn't as clear cut two lines. Some variants may be likely on the side of deleterious or more likely neutral. Uh, but current tools today tend to provide a range of scores, which is really a lot more complicated to, to interpret. 
Um, and every tool has its own parameters and maybe every tool isn't best for the data you're working with. So at this point, you know, we're having a look at the kinds of algorithms that you can run and the tools to use for prediction. And we're also finding ourselves a bit, a bit lost. Uh, but luckily there was amazing work done by Zhu et al. Um, characterizing, you know, the kinds of algorithms that are available, whether they're used for functional prediction, whether they're using them to look at evolutionary conservation, or maybe you're using tools that combine those metrics to make estimations about your variance. Um, and why we looked at them in particular detail is we were wondering, you know, what tools are best for ADME variation? Um, the nature of ADME genes is unique in that we, we understand them uh, by how they're involved with drugs we use today, but they may not have had those evolutionary pressures as other genes that are used to build up the tool models. So maybe there are some that work better. And, and this is the paper I was talking about. Uh, these, these researchers developed an optimized framework, so a selection of tools and adjustments to them uh, to, to best assess ADME variation. And what they've done is they've they've summarized, you know, what are the conventional scores that you'll use to, to classify variants with these. And they've had a look at a, a set of true positive and true negative ADME variants and seen, could you adjust the threshold of those scores to try and get a better point of view for a particular variant? I'll use an example of SIFT. Um, so SIFT will classify your variants, you know, into deleterious or not, or tolerated or not, if your variant score is below 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.05. Uh, but for ADME genes, the researchers found that if you lower that score uh, down to 0.03, you might get better specificity uh, for ADME genes. So this interests us quite a lot. But the researchers didn't stop there. They went ahead and de designed a model uh, to see, can you improve overall sensitivity and specificity um, if you combine some of these tool sets together and use the estimations of all of, uh, of, all of those sets to classify your variants? And... Uh, so it seems a little bit in the way here. But you can see that they started learning that there's a little bit of a trade-off with some tools. Some tools have great sensitivity, but not specificity. Uh, so the need was quite clear. And the model that they devised uh, performs really well in terms of both sensitivity and specificity. Um, and it incorporates you know, a set of five tools. So we went on to include those into our models. Uh, so we built a bioinformatics workflow uh, that would take our variants stored in our variant core files, submit them to a, a you know, workflow that would annotate them with these scores, find the prediction scores for these, and then automatically choose the variants that fit through. And then we came up with a set that we're pretty sure that these are likely to impact ADME gene function. So what happens when you when you run a workflow like this on African data? And just some early results, well, some some great results from our paper. Okay, they're not early anymore. <laughs> um, and uh, just to, to add here, we, we were also interested in you know what variants are distributed like across the African continent. So we did some PCA analysis just to differentiate population clusters. And we took all that data, those 458 genomes, supplemented them with a lot of data from Thousand Genomes Project um, and a lot of uh, genotyping data too. So we could generate this plot. Um, it, it's basically to try and cluster out which Africans are more related to another. So we can make these broad regions to compare. Far West African, Western African, Southern Central African, and Southern Africans. Um, now the circles I've drawn here are just diagrammatic. Um, the, the clusters were determined uh, algorithmically with k-means clustering. Uh, but this gives us a very broad view. And of course, it's, it's not perfect. Uh, this is the data we have. If you have more African data, this will get more accurate. Um, so this is just an early start. Right. So following the models of, of running through all this data, we can compare these uh, clusters together. We identified around 900 of the variants that are likely to impact gene function according to that model. And we saw something very interesting. If we try to stratify them across our groups, you find that only 104 of those are shared between all four of the African clusters. Whereas every individual cluster tends to have similar numbers, if not more variants unique to their own cluster. So we found that quite interesting, that there's quite a high degree of variability in variants that might impact ADME gene function. We took a look at those common variants, those variants that are more common than 1% allele frequency and tend to be shared between all four of the groups. And we found that if we distribute them according to increasing allele frequency, so increasing state of commonness, 
you find that at the rarer end, you know, there are a lot of spottiness. Variants might be in one group or two groups and not another. Uh, but that can even happen at common stages. For example, here that there's a variant in Southern African populations, around 20% of your frequency that's completely absent from far West Africans. And even as you go more and more common, it's not a clear picture. It's not a homogeneous distribution of frequency across the groups. So a variant might be more relevant in a particular African cluster than in others. And now that we've got this brilliant set of variants that we can, we can um, you know, say, we think it's likely to impact the gene, we can do more complex analysis like looking at fixation index uh, to compare that set of variants between our clusters. So what I've got here is a plot of showing geographic centroids of the populations that contribute to, to the cluster, and we can compare those to, to one another. And this figure on the left over here is for our ADME high impact variant list that we identified. And we see that overall, you know, the FSD values are not so large, but comparatively, uh, they reveal some interesting features. For example, the largest difference here is between Southern African cluster and the far West African cluster. And that difference is statistically significant if you had randomly sampled the same number of variants from, from overall genetic variation. On the right over here, we've got the total set of ADME variation, and we can see that the FSD values are higher, uh, so the differences become more apparent. However, in terms of general ADME variation, uh, none of those comparisons are significantly different from, from normal genomic variation. It's just randomly selected across the genome. Um, so we, we think that there are some key features in, in, in variants that are likely functional that are differentiating across these groups. Now, another kind of annotation you can do if you have the starts already and you have some expertise is to try and understand if your variants are novel. So you would need an existing database of variants that have been discovered before. Um, so these plots represent a, a, a just a distribution of novel variants and how they overlap between the clusters. And with an example of Southern Africa in here, uh, we've started at the most common frequency and we've just we displayed them in a descending order. So here's the least common. And we see that although you do get overlap between groups at the common levels, uh, very quickly, you have a lot of rare variation that's novel and specific to only one African cluster. Uh, so we found that quite interesting. And just a note over here on the far Western cluster, we didn't have too much high coverage data for far West. So it's not that there's less variation here. It's just that there isn't enough data to cover this region. So there are a lot of challenges that can come up with functional prediction. Some of the ones we found is that if you're pulling data from diverse sources like this, um, each of them can have a very, very large database file, larger than 80 gigabytes per tool that you're interested in using. Um, and that could fill up the hard drive of any student trying to research this. So uh, you'd probably want to do this in a high performance computing environment, working on a cluster, working remotely, um, so that other users can also share the, the big downloaded databases. Um, and that's quite important for reproducibility. You know, having separate data sets done separately is not, is not ideal. Um, of course, using the right tool of choice is very relevant there. So we used variant effect predictor that we coupled with plugins to allow us to pull out those scores. But there are other ways of doing it too. You can use ANOVAR, you can use SNPF, and you can also add plugins to those tools. Uh, but they do require maintenance and you do need to make sure that you've downloaded the right sets and got them in the right places. And to keep going over time, the tools will update and you need to make sure that you follow up with the versions and you're quite specific of the versions that you, you used in those. In, in those. Um, so which is very difficult from you know, an African point of view with limited bandwidth. You, know, you're not, you might want to think of doing this in collaboration with a large group. Um, another limit of prediction tools is a lot of them pr primarily based only or, or only use you know DNA based features. Um, some of them incorporate some protein metrics, but it's very limited. So you're getting very genomic view of functional prediction, uh, which might or not always lead you to the right answer you're looking for. You know when you're trying to investigate why your drug is not working in a particular population group. And of course, uh, here's a plot we haven't shown often, uh, but we're quite uh, quite interested now. In so this is a distribution of our novel variants in terms of their type. So variant effect predictors told us their types. Um, and for interest, the variants that come up most often in terms of functional prediction are missense variants. And this is the scale of missense variants in comparison to all the other novel variants 
that we identified. And what that means is there's a, um, there's a severe knowledge gap here uh, for any one of those other variants that may have a functional impact that we haven't got a fleet of tools ready to, to analyze. Um, so a lot of big research questions coming up from there uh, that I think will take a lot of global efforts to investigate. My current work uh, following on from this is to try and look at some structural bioinformatics, particularly with one gene, uh, G6PD, visualizing variants on here, trying to understand where its ligands are and what they're going to do. And this can help allow us to unpack some more protein specific effects now that we've identified which variants are interesting from a genomic perspective. And yeah, we've got a preprint out of this work. So if you're interested, you can have over to BioArchive. Um, you can see the, our work there, comments on it. It's also in the works for publication. Hopefully we'll have uh, good news to share that very soon. And yeah, very proud of this. And it's a really good start to, to analyzing admin data. But as I've shown, if we want to get to really good levels to enact precision medicine, we've got a few ways to go still. And of course, uh, you know, acknowledging everyone who worked on this, this work was not done in isolation. It's a really big collaborative effort Thanks to all the collaborators, uh, working closely with all of you has been fantastic. And of course, to Hussein and my supervisors who have uh, been inval like, invaluable. Really, really great to work with all of you guys there. Um, I'm going to let Hussein continue because he's going to expand on some interesting things and happy to chat and take questions after that. Thanks, Dave. I um, wanted to talk first about uh, one of the major outcomes that uh, uh, that we had we we got from the uh, our admi analysis uh, uh, for the high coverage genome, and uh, the basic idea is uh, we come up the term called the genetic diversity bottleneck in precision medicine, and basically here the uh, the idea is that in an ideal scenario each uh, genetic makeup in a population is assigned to a clinical action. However, if the granularity of the stratification of the population increases and uh, the proportion of rare veins with function and impact is significant, uh, it can leave may, many individuals uh, outside the actionability plan. So really understanding the, the impact of these veins at the genome level uh, is, is very important. And uh, th that would give us also a, a great insight um, uh, to understand the, prot the protein drug and direction uh, and also to uh, to to understand the the functional uh, impact in pharmacogenomic analysis. So we have seen that already uh, in our dataset when we analyze the impact of uh, some of the novel variants. Uh, so, for example, for CFTR here, you have this uh, mutation. Uh, it's the threonine uh, substitution to to alanine, and it's uh, located in uh, what we call the the lasso segment. And the lasso segment is responsible. Uh, for the protein-protein uh, interaction of uh, CFTR uh, with other uh, mic uh, macromolecules. Uh, also, if you see this mutation, this is also substitution of uh, STD to uh, glutamine. Uh, and uh, this amino acid is very close to the, uh, to the ADP. So it's, uh, so, and, and, and this is really a, a, a very important uh, uh, fight in the, in the protein. So this, uh, this variant uh, would probably be uh, uh, of high relevance in terms of, of, of function for the ABCB1 uh, protein. And we didn't limit ourselves uh, only to this uh, inspection. So we pushed things further. So, and uh, we studied the extent of the genetic variability in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and taking as a model the CYP3A5 uh, protein. And CYP3A5 is one of the most important pharmacogenes because uh, I think it, it metabolizes uh, or the, the CYP3A uh, family metabol uh, subfamily metabolizes, I think, 4% of the entire uh, drug spectrum. Um, so uh, we included um, uh, five uh, mistense variants, and as you can see, all of them, they are rare. And also we all included uh, the Y53C uh, substitution because we know that this uh, substitution, it belongs to the star allele 11 uh, and for which we have the strong biochemical evidence uh, about the, its role in the uh, reduction of the catalytic activity of the enzyme. And in the figure here, you can see the location of each one of these uh, uh, variants, uh, but also you can see the most important uh, segment in the uh, segment of the protein. So including the catalytic uh, site, 
and also the FG loop and the BC loop. So the FG and the BC loops are actually um, the gatekeepers for the uh, interaction uh, side here. Okay, then we use molecular dynamics to predict the effect of these variants. And uh, in this type of simulation, we can monitor the conformational changing uh, of the system as a function of time. So what, what we can do basically is to take the structure of CYP3A5, modify it according to uh, the different variants that we have, and then uh, add the solvent molecule, the counter ions adjust the, the temperature uh, and, the, uh, um, uh, and the pH and, uh, and all uh, many other parameters. Uh, and then we take this system, so we give it uh, some sort of uh, velocities and uh, we monitor it uh, uh, using uh, for, for the simulation. Uh, and because, because the type of uh, events uh, uh, we are interested in, like the, the large scale dynamics, uh, including the loop and uh, loop uh, movement, the domain movement, uh, and also the drug uh, binding and binding uh, events, so we simulated the system for 1.5 microseconds, which is uh, significant. Uh, so because uh, if we want to simulate uh, uh, an event, we have uh, to increase the simulation time beyond the, uh, the, the time uh, uh, during which that uh, event happened. And uh, we have, uh, so the first thing we did is we, we compare our, uh, the, the the structural drift of the variance compared to, to the wild type. And as you can see, we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, noticed any major changing in the structure. So all the, uh, all the RMSD values and the RMSD stands for root mean square uh, deviation. So uh, all the RMSDs are below uh, 0.2 nanometers. Uh, and normally if we, uh, if we have an RMSD more than three angstrom or 0 0.3 nanometers, then we can say that there is really a, a structural drift. But here, as you can see, all the variants, uh, they, they, uh, they don't uh, show that, uh, that difference with the, uh, with the wild type structure. And that really uh, raises a big question because we are uh, sure about the effect of at least uh, two of these, uh, of these variants, including the R28C uh, and the Y53C. Um, and one of the scenarios that can explain this is that the, the pattern of dynamics has changed. And the pattern of dynamics are a set of regular movements used by the protein for specific functional purposes. Um, so we can study these patterns thanks to a set of techniques called essential dynamics and we can represent them as uh, porcupine plots. So in por the porcupine plots, you have the, uh, the backbone of the protein and you have these arrows assigned to each uh, atom in the protein. And uh, each arrow actually is, um, points to, to the direction of the, uh, the motion, but also the amplitude uh, of the motion. So this analysis shows that the residue, residues belonging to the segments controlling the access uh, to the uh, catalytic size are the major contributors in the protein motion uh, for, for all the variants. Uh, however, also the amplitude of the direction uh, and the direction of the, these the amino acids differ significantly uh, between all the variants, but also if you compare uh, the, the, the variants to, to, to the wild type. Um, and uh, if I remind you, uh, the, B, uh, the BC and FG loops, uh, so the FG loop is in, in green here, and as you can see, uh, its movement is very, very uh, different between all the, uh, all the, the, the variants. And one of uh, the most uh, powerful things about the uh, molecular dynamics uh, simulations are, is that this technique is, is capable to study the free energy landscape uh, of a system. So from our side, uh, this is motivated by the question of um, whether we, the, the stable set of confirmations for CYP3A5 uh, for the different variants are similar or not similar. So we established the free energy landscape, which, uh, which you may regard as a set of valleys um, uh, and, and hills. Uh, and where the most stable energy is uh, situated at, at lower level of energy. And then we compared each one uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of these, stable uh, these stable structures for the variance uh, to the wild type form. And as you can see, when we project these 
uh, structures uh, on the free energy landscape uh, of the wild type, we see that they are not located at the same level. So even like we have uh, like these, uh, the R twenty eight C here is at higher level, significantly higher level than the the, the wild type. And what what that that really shows or that suggests actually uh, that at the equilibrium uh, at the equilibrium these structures are are very different. And we were also able to see this even um, if we we we. Uh, uh, we fit the structure of the wild type with the structure of the uh, of the variant. As as you can see, there is a major movement in the uh, the the FG loop here, uh, which uh, which uh, uh, again uh, the, these segments control the accessibility of uh, the drug to the catalytic uh, binding site. So the impact of the gene variability can result in a genet uh, generic effect, but also. Uh, a variant may affect the protein function in different ways, depending on the drug. Uh, and that adds another level of complexity uh, to the pharmacogenomic uh, problem. So for example, uh, a variant A uh, can affect a response to a drug. And if we know how uh, to counterbalance this uh, deleterious effect clinically, uh, the variant can, uh, could be uh, labeled as uh, actionable. But the same uh, variant also, uh, and uh, given another drug, uh, maybe it's not, it's not uh, an actionable uh, variant. And on the other hand, if we take the same protein uh, and another variant from that protein, it might be actionable for uh, the, the, the second drug, but not actionable for the, uh, for, uh, it might be act uh, actionable for the, the first dr drug, but not for the second drug. So for CYP3A5, we were able to spot such effect at the molecular level by uh, studying the interaction of in the enzyme with uh, two drugs, ritonavir and artimeter. Um, at first, we have observed that the genetic di uh, uh, diversity uh, has a considerable effect on defining the volume of the interaction site here. And you can see this from uh, in, in the V38A uh, uh, variant, uh, also this variant and, and, and this variant. Then we noticed uh, that the pocket volume um, and the interaction energy uh, are highly correlated for ritonavir, uh, judged also by the uh, R-square coefficient here. Uh, but it's not the same case for, for uh, artimeter. Uh, also, you can see that uh, um, how some of these variants for uh, ritonavir, um, they show um, uh, they, they show um, an unfavorable interaction energy. However, for uh, altimeter, it's not the, the same case here. Uh, and that, that, maybe, that suggests that the, uh, the interaction with altimeter uh, might, may not affect it in the, in the case of these uh, variants. But for the tonavir, uh, definitely there is uh, an effect of these variants uh, uh, on, the, on the binding properties of the, uh, of the drug. So the takeaway here uh, is that genetic variability might have an extended effect on uh, the functional properties of the protein that include both plasticity related and uh, drug binding related characteristics. Uh, also, we can speculate that uh, rare variants might have a significant functional relevance uh, for determining the pharmacological properties of, uh, of ADB gene. So now that we have seen uh, such effect on, uh, of the rare variant on the ADMI uh, genes, uh, here is the, the problem that we are facing. Uh, if we are going to sequence more uh, samples, we, have, we may identify uh, more, more uh, rare variants. Um, uh, if so facto, we may also identify uh, unique, other unique actionable uh, or unique putative actionable uh, variants. And the problem uh, can be formulated as follows. So we want to detect the variants uh, with likely impact on the protein function based on structural and biophysical uh, annotation. However, the variant prediction tools are very limited in, in such regards. Uh, perhaps the SIFT and Polyphen are the widest used tools in, uh, in, uh, in such, uh, for such aim, and none of them actually uh, are able to annotate based on the structure. Well, they can, they can definitely integrate some structure, integrate some structure and data, 
but they don't uh, they don't have an ad hoc solution for uh, for annotating uh, based on the biophysical and structural uh, relevance. And these two uh, tools also suffer from uh, the sensitivity uh, sensitivity issues. Uh, they are poorly benchmarked. Uh, and this is maybe one of the reasons that we use a different annotation schema in uh, for ADME genes uh, using the G minor workflow that we use for for uh, for the genomic uh, annotation. And on the other hand, if uh, if you want also to apply uh, multi-scale uh, modeling methods like molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, you won't be able to screen uh, all the variants uh, in your genetic pool because these methods, uh, they, they don't really scale very well and uh, they're uh, laborious and they require um, uh, some, uh, some set of ha hardware uh, like uh, GPUs in the case of uh, molecular uh, dynamics. So it's not really an option to use molecular dynamics to annotate uh, all the, the variants in, in, uh, in, let's say, of, uh, the, in ADME genes or in the genome. And for for such uh, for such end, we have uh, we have uh, developed the SWAT workflow, and SWAT here stands for Sexual Workflow for Annotating ADME Gene Targets. And SWAT consists of around uh, 30, uh, 3,500 uh, lines on, on Python, uh, and uh, it also it, it uses um, so SWAT also uses uh, other uh, other set uh, of packages and software. And uh, the, the sequence of execution for, for these uh, tools, they are monitored by, uh, by Nextflow. Uh, and SWAT is actually composed of two workflows. So we have the auxiliary workflow and we have also the main workflow. And for the main workflow here, uh, this is the main engine for SWAT because it's able uh, to, uh, to annotate the, the variants and to calculate different uh, properties. And in developing SWAT, we kept in mind uh, four main principles. So the first one is that SWAT must uh, have the ability to predict the variant uh, effect on the folding energy uh, and the effect on the confirmation and behavior of the protein. And you can see this from uh, the case of TP53 uh, protein. So uh, we have the wild type uh, in uh, green and we have uh, a high destabilizing mutation in, uh, in orange. And you can see there is nearly a perfect match between the two structures. So that shows that if you only consider uh, 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 the, the rigid structure in the, uh, or, in, or one single point, um, uh, single point calculation uh, in, 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 your, uh, in your analysis, then it might not maybe, uh, it might not give you the, the full picture of what's happening exactly uh, in, in your body. And the second principle for SWAT is that uh, the, the workflow should be able to, to tell if a variant is uh, a possible interaction uh, with a drug or not. The third principle is uh, SWAT should integrate different levels of uh, and information uh, from different sources to annotate the, the variant. And the fourth, uh, the fourth principle is that SWAT should be easily adapted for uh, all the ends. And Basically, to run the, 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 the main workflow, a user needs only a VCF file. Uh, all other dependencies are, uh, uh, are stored in uh, an internal database, which is generated using, uh, using the uh, auxiliary uh, workflow. And SWAT will collect uh, different properties that serve as input for random forest machine learning models that predict the impact of the variance uh, on the protein structure. And uh, lastly, the report consists of a detailed uh, CSV file and also an interactive HTML, HTML file for a better readability of the, uh, the results. So currently we included 26 genes uh, in SWAT and they, these genes, they were selected for, uh, for their uh, relevance in, uh, in pharmaco, uh, pharmacogenomics and precision uh, medicine. So we got 11 genes from uh, uh, cytochrome P50, uh, P450 uh, uh, family. Uh, we, have, we got also three, uh, three uh, genes from the glutathion estron spiral. And uh, we got other genes, including uh, DPYD and SALT1A1. Um, however, the user can easily use the auxiliary workflow if he wants to, to add other uh, ADME or, or even non-ADME genes. 
So, for example, if user wants to annotate uh, protein or to annotate variants from uh, a specific uh, involved in specific pathway, uh, he just needs to provide the structure of for these uh, corresponding uh, proteins and their identifiers, and the auxiliary workflow will uh, take care all the, for all the work and will uh, will generate the database for uh, for for these uh, uh, proteins. And then SWAT reports uh, include a rich set of information and the detailed, uh, uh, detailed inventory of uh, sequence-based and structural-based annotation tools. So for example, the uh, red flags uh, are a set of uh, predefined uh, rules uh, that uh, uh, given if, if they happen that there is uh, a very big chance that this variant will be uh, deleterious. So for example, you have the disulfide breakage. You have also the uh, uh, the, the the burial of the charge uh, of the charge within the core of the protein. You have also the uh, the switch of the second to uh, of the secondary structure. Uh, and SWAT also can uh, report the drug binding hotspots uh, within the protein and also the uh, the stability hotspots for for that uh, protein. Finally, SWAT integrates a random forest machine learning a model trained or using uh, nearly 1500 uh, PDB structures of uh, different mutations. And the model can be used to, as an additional indicator uh, of the relevance of the, the variant to predict. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, you can use this, uh, all these sets of information to decide uh, if you are going to prioritize this variant or, or not. So if you are interested in, in SWAT, you may find it in, uh, in uh, my GitHub account uh, under the repository name SWAT. And finally, I'd like to thank all my, our collaborators, uh, collaborators of the consortium uh, led by Professor Scott Heiselhardt. Um, we have, uh, so uh, all our, our members from uh, the Witt University, Rhodes University, CBIO, uh, University of Khartoum, uh, uh, University of British Columbia, and of course our uh, founders from uh, GSK. Also, I'd like to thank all the CHPC uh, guys who really facilitate this work, including uh, the the uh, they 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 put to our uh, to 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 our rescue the the the, the GPUs but uh, GPU machi machines in order to simulate the the uh, the molecular dynamics. Um, uh, and with that, my dear fellows, uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, for your patience. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sam, and thank you, George, uh, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, so uh, with that, I invite questions from the audience. Uh, you could post the question in the chat box or uh, raise your hand to unmute. Uh, perhaps I can start uh, with, with a question for George. Um, yes. So, uh, could you comment maybe on some of the challenges, maybe with putting together the hard data set? For example, we know that people have different data sources. Some of them could be low coverage, others could be high coverage. So, on some of those challenges. And then, oh, yeah. Also, yeah. Okay. Another question. And I shall answer this one, then you ask the next one. Sure. Um, so, so one of the difficulties with putting together, you know, very diverse data sets is you kind of have to recall them in order to make sure that you get an even analysis of your variation. Um, and that's quite computationally expensive. Another challenge is getting everyone to collaborate effectively with the fair principles, um, you know, that the data likewise protects or you know all the patient and sample data is protected um, but that you can still enable the sharing effectively so there are a few issues there but uh, there's a great great series on unfair data and how to work coming up with h3a bionet if you're interested in learning more about that oh, okay great uh, and then the other thing is about a database for um, these pharmacogenomic variants um, like how, because would, is it like a, a way forward you're looking at to catalog some of them? And because if we have to implement like precision medicine in Africa, mm -hmm. then this would be maybe a good resource. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
these variants, we, we haven't really made a decision whether we're going to make a database so people can store and access some info about them. Uh, but there are some efforts to, to make a large you know, precision medicine portal. Um, Hussein and I involved with that to try to capture all the all the known data for drug response in African populations, specifically with with clinical backing, and I, I think that's one of the challenges for moving our work forward. Is it's, you know, if you want to enable precision medicine, you've got to take this to the clinical side of experimentation, so you can have more concrete um, estimations of what a variant is going to do, and what you should adjust to make sure the drug reaction goes well. Um, which is difficult because you, you need to lay lots of sources, clinical, genomic, proteomic, uh, structural bioinformatics, all needs to come together to enable that. And okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, and then we have a question here from Brian. Uh, he says that the PCA only shows 54% of the variation. And he's saying, is that, he's asking, is that too low or it's fine? Uh, it's a good question. It's enough for, for what we're comparing, you know, that we we're trying to get a, a decent estimation of how these groups separate. But as I mentioned, um, as you as you keep adding more African data sets, that, that PCA is probably going to become more a, a line than distinct groups uh, that can separate out. Um, so yeah, good, good question. Okay, uh, uh, please keep your questions coming in. Um... I see a Prof. Colin has unmuted. Uh, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, uh, first, I want to thank you both for a great presentation and very exciting, really. So I just wanted to you to discuss your observations when you're looking at the diversity of the pharmacogenes. I see you have sort of lumped them together, but I would want to think that the different groups, whether they are drug transporters, drug metabolizing enzymes and other um, genes, they are under different evolutionary pressure and their diversity and difference might be different. Have you had any opportunity to look into the different classes and see any differences? So- Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Hussein yeah. can take that one. Yeah. I think that, uh, that actually, uh, that's a very good question, and uh, we had a, the, a comment from a reviewer about it because um, sometimes also we give this false um, impression that these uh, genes they evolve uh, together, um, yeah, but they are not. And uh, however, in 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 uh, for the first analysis, we wanted to see uh, the 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 landscape uh, of variability for these uh, these genes. And we may not maybe have the opportunity to focus uh, on them um, uh, in a detailed manner, but maybe in the the second phase uh, that we are ongoing now, we we doing that. And I actually, uh, David is here is uh, is really uh, focusing on CYP two D six CYP two D six gene. Um, so we is doing uh, the haplotype analysis. Uh, the uh, we evaluate lots of uh, um, uh, algorithms for. For genotyping, but also uh, we uh, we we are also studying the DPYD uh, gene, um, the CYP3A5. So definitely, these genes they they really uh, they really deserve uh, an individual focus in order to to raise this question. Um, in terms of evolution, really, I don't uh, I don't uh, I mean your opinion. I don't think that uh, they, we will have the same uh, pattern. Um, uh, for 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 these uh, for these genes, uh, even within the the class or uh, the same uh, family of uh, uh, of protein. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, just a quick follow up. I think you both pointed out uh, the fact that there is a substrate uh, variant specific uh, effect, which makes it difficult because if variant A affects drug A severely, you would want to make a generalization, but that doesn't sometimes work. When you go to drug B, the outcome is going to be different. So I was wondering, how do you want to address this, uh, this issue if we are going to have any generalizable precision medicine tool? Um, well, just, just uh, do you want to, to say something? I'll, I'll say after you if you want. 
yeah sure you can you can do from the protein yeah. side um ideally we would need something like uh, a scalable assay that you could introduce different drugs into in, and get a readout for different variants and how they behave um and then you create like an ontology structure of a variant drug relationship that's ideal um and we aren't trying too much of that we're still on the surface level of of understanding what variation is there but we're very interested in seeing that work happen in future yeah so okay. for, for my side um i think uh we just scratching the, the surface now and what we are seeing now is just the uh, the tip of the iceberg because of this uh, genetic viability is really problematic um, so for my side i don't really believe in a generic uh, guidelines or for for that that incorporates all the drugs together or but in this regard maybe the uh, the uh, the predictive techniques and the AI, ai techniques they can really help uh, in stratifying the the phenotypes so that we can uh, we can have uh, uh, let's say quasi uh, quasi uh, uh, generalized uh, uh, guidelines. So uh, and and in the future maybe because the, we are expecting the uh, the, the sequencing uh, cost to drop. Uh, definitely we will need uh, we will need another maybe another perspective uh, to approach precision medicine because. I think precision medicine now is not, a, at least, at least, um, at least in the current situation, it's not only about uh, collecting uh, genetic data and phenotypic data. Uh, I think the, the there are lots of other sites that uh, we should cover, including the economical sites and the business models and uh, and, uh, and the ethical uh, sites. So, so yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Prof. Kalen. And maybe as a follow-up to that, as uh, we wait for more questions from the audience. Uh, so how, since for some of the genes, uh, if you've already um, stabilized uh, the system for molecular dynamics for some of the drugs, uh, would, it, would it then be easier afterwards to look at follow-up drugs? Because if you already have, I think the, the bulk of the work is really setting up the system uh, for the molecular dynamics, so it should be easier afterwards to look at some other drugs. Um, uh, depends, actually, yeah. because mo most of the time when we want to establish the uh, the complex between a drug and and its target, we use molecular docking, and the molecular docking now, although they uh, they really. Uh, uh, they are progressed very well in the last year, uh, last couple of years. They're still not uh, as accurate as we uh, we want. Uh, so, like if you if you want to set up all the simulation uh, parameters, when you can do that, you have uh, SIP two A five. I mean, all this all this set of parameters you can use it for other drugs. But then you have to start from a structure where you are sure enough that the drug will interact. Uh, with that way with your, your uh, with your protein um, so so yeah I, I can't really answer with yes or no so really it depends it depends on how much you have uh, as uh, structural data uh, how much also you have as biological data because definitely uh, these biological data that can be used to restrain the uh, the, uh, the docking poses and to to get a high quality uh, complexes uh, but the the other side of the story is that um, uh, yeah I, I think we should also focus on these uh, methods because in the upcoming years we're expecting uh, there's already a revolution that uh, that's happening in the sexual biology uh, with the upcoming uh, of the the uh, the electromicroscopy um, cryoelectro microscopy and the PDB database now is uh, is uh, is really um, uh, more rich with these kinds of structures, and with with this with this technique, you we will be uh, able to uh, simulate uh, entire um, complex um, uh, structure biologically relevant uh, macromolecules. So, in the maybe in the next years, uh, we will have uh, uh, the uh, the whole proteome uh, covered by the structures by the uh, by the PDB, and if we 
can have that then and maybe we can uh, we can get uh, better annotation plans for for our variants uh, okay thanks Hussein. um we have some more questions from Uh, then maybe a question for George as we wrap up. Um, so uh, have, have you, uh, in, in your work, have you identified some of the, some of the ways we can use to uh, maybe streamline or extend the proteomic, uh, protein bioinformatics work? Because like across the African continent, maybe this, the expertise is not yet so widespread. Um, so like ways to either uh, share workflows or maybe deliver some training, so. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a good question and it's, it's things we need to do more of. Um, I definitely think that, that structural work is enabled with a high performance computing environment. Um, and in the past, it, it was very difficult to get a, a, you know, a really good set of, of GPUs available for this kind of work, but the price of GPUs has come down quite substantially in, in recent years. So if you can apply those to this work, you know, have a center that, that's got the tools enabled and, and is ready to go and collaborate, then that would really help things out. Uh, Hussein and I have been using the Center for High Performance Computing down in Cape Town, uh, but there is certainly potential for other African centers to emerge. Awesome. Uh, then uh, there's a question from Emilienne. Uh, she says, uh, congrats to the presenters. Uh, she wishes to inquire about extracting copy number and structure variants for African population. Well, uh, we will definitely have to put you in touch with our colleague, Lara, who is becoming our resident expert on copy number variation. Uh, David, perhaps we should invite Lara for a talk here. Yeah, that would be awesome. I think she's already so, here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Um, well, uh, without, well, I would, on behalf of Afripop Gen, uh, I just want to extend a big thank you to George and to Hussein. Uh, first of all, for the amazing work you're doing, and also for the wonderful talks. And for enlightening us, you know, about pharmacogenomics uh, and about the potential uh, that we have here in Africa to um, move precision medicine forward. 